<laughs> nice. Very cool. Hi, yeah, hi this everyone. is going to be great. Oh, we're live. No worries, no worries. But it is great. You can see even our hosts are very excited to be here, as am I. So um, before I hand over to them, I'd just like to uh, give a quick introduction to the Intaba X and, and, and why we're here. So if you aren't familiar with the uh, larger Deep Learning Intaba initiative, which um, has the sole aim of bringing um, and strengthening African machine learning. And the Ndaba X is a part of this. It is um, each country hosts their own events. So if you're interested, take a look at the Ndaba, uh, the Ndaba's website and you'll find um, all the countries that are hosting their own um, Ndaba Xs. Uh, it's quite cool with everything being online that there's a good chance you'll be able to um, see events from, from many different African countries. And just on note while we're here, uh, if you aren't familiar, there's the mentorship program, uh, which is open to mentees from the African machine learning community. So we encourage you to sign up. Everything from planning a career to writing a research article uh, will connect you with um, a mentor from our global network, and uh, you will get help in that area. Uh, if you're, um, so it is exclusive to African um, mentees, but as a mentor from, please, if you're uh, joining us from overseas, we'd love to have you join our network. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, all the different countries that are hosting the Andaba Xs, uh, it really does cover the entire continent. Just like to give a special shout out to the Andaba X team that's been putting this together along with the entire roadshow that we've had, uh, well, basically the last two months, and we still have a, a whole month of events uh, lined up after this. So uh, be sure to check out the websites and um, have a look there. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, you're welcome to join the community on Discord. Uh, there's a big green button at the bottom of the screen. You can join there, and then uh, you can join in the conversation and um, yeah, meet some very interesting people online. Also um, of quite a bit of importance is the uh, Indaba X Awards. Um, these are everything from uh, coding awards to um, community engagement. So please nominate your friends if you know someone, but also please feel free to nominate yourself. Um, I'm sure you're all doing fantastic work, so um, please, please um, let us know about it. So um, just like to then thank well our host today, but also one of our most gracious sponsors um, who have their um, very special prize for extraordinary engagement. So uh, this is uh, basically you can nominate yourself or someone else that is going to extraordinary machine learning in South Africa. And then uh, just just before we I hand over, um, just a shout out to all our sponsors who without without them, uh, this wouldn't be possible. So uh, we are um, very grateful for their support. Okay, so that's enough for me. Um, I am going to sign off now and hand over to the team from SD. Thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Uh, so yeah, first of all, I just want to um, you know say a warm, warm welcome to everyone here today uh, joining us for uh, this event. So in Sadeep's version of of the roadshow. Um, but yeah, just before going into any of like what we'd be offering today, I just really want to uh, send out a huge, huge thanks to the Indaba uh, X team. Um, having been involved in some of uh, organization for previous events, I know it's uh, very time consuming and, and it really takes a lot of effort to, to do this. And uh, the organizing on this has been absolutely amazing. Uh, so I really just want to thank you guys for doing this. And just in general, how important it is for, for us to come together like this for the ecosystem. Uh, yeah, trying to you know strengthen ML in, in South Africa, but also you know, obviously the global movement uh, across the African continent is really important. And uh, you know, from InsaDeep side, we uh, it almost feels a bit like a family event here. Uh, I met Kalia at, at an Indaba. Uh, you know, uh, many of you who are connecting here are, are good friends through through the Indaba network, and um, it's been a really amazing experience to 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 grow together in some sense. And um, the 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 team here at InstaDeep uh, very much um, you know feels a part of this this family, and and we hope to. You know, keep uh, investing and also trying to 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 join the effort to try and build the ecosystem and try and help and um, do as much as we can to kind of work together and see uh, you know uh, where we can uh, you know be of benefit and really uh, care about uh, the future that we're trying to create here together. So um, yeah, thanks so much for being here and um, we hope uh, you'll enjoy the event. So what's coming up is Tom is just going to share a bit. 
about uh, in city like who we are and the type of things we work on just for um, uh, those who don't know uh, anything about the, us but even uh, some some of you have heard about the company just to maybe get some some insight uh, further and then uh, Kaliab has, has uh, prepared an absolute treat I think of a workshop um, on multi-agent RL and uh, playing Starcraft so I really really hope uh, you'll enjoy that um, yeah and and thanks for being here. So I'll hand over to uh, Tom now. Great, thanks so much. Um, I think, can you pull up the slides, Kalia? Perfect. Um, so yeah, my name's Tom, uh, great to be here. So I'll just be telling you guys a bit about uh, InstaDeep and giving you a bit of an introduction to the company and some of the projects we're involved in. Um, so yeah, we can go forward with the slides. Next one. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, um, Instadeep was actually founded in Tunisia. So it's an African ML company, which is very, very cool. And since then, it's really spread all over the world. So we've got offices in the UK, Paris, uh, Tunisia, obviously, Dubai, Nigeria, and then the Cape Town office, which is actually quite a new office. It was uh, opened last year. Um, so, and it's quite a sort of up and coming office in the, in the company. So it's a very, very exciting place to be. And essentially, you know, the skills are set acro across a variety of different branches, such as visualization, high performance computing, and then, um, you know, different AI researchers. And one of the cool things about the office is that we've, we've kind of got a research team, which is really aiming to publish papers and to push the, the bounds of, you know, what's possible with machine learning. And then we've also got an engineering or applied team, which are working with clients on real world problems. And what's quite cool about this setup is that they sort of feed into each other. So the engineering team kind of guides the, you know, the research team as to what problems we'd really like solved. And then we can also, you know, leverage some of the expertise coming from that side and the new sort of algorithms and, and frameworks that they, they've been developing. Perfect. So on the next slide, uh, we'll just go through some of the projects that we're involved in. Um, so you can just go to the next slide, Kaliab. Oh, um, Perfect. Perfect. So we've got a variety of different uh, projects. So one of the, the main projects we've actually been getting involved in recently is in the biology space. So we've been uh, working with companies like BioNTech to develop uh, novel immunotherapies using, you know, uh, cutting edge uh, ML methods and really trying to push the frontiers of, you know, what tools are available for biologists. And then we're also involved in PCB uh, boards. So that's uh, routing circuit boards. And then we've had quite a long partnership with Deutsche Bahn in Germany, whereby we optimize their train scheduling. And then most recently, something we're very, very proud of, which we're going to be showing off today is this Marva framework, which is basically the research teams created an open source library specifically designed for multi-agent reinforcement learning. Can keep going. Perfect. So just to dive into a little bit more about our collaboration with BioNTech. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of BioNTech from the BioNTech Pfizer vaccine. Um, perhaps you have some of that uh, running through your veins as well. Um, so as I said before here, the goal is really to push, push the boundaries of what tools are available for biologists and using those tools to develop novel immunotherapies. Um, and some of the problems we're looking at at the moment are, you know, a range of cancers and other infectious diseases. And what's quite cool is that you can use a lot of ML methods for things like drug design, so developing mRNA vaccines, therapeutics, as well as protein engineering. And at the bottom there, that there's some of the, you know, the research we've been doing on actually designing prospective COVID-19 therapeutics, uh, leveraging reinforcement learning. Next slide. Perfect. So another major project, as I've briefly mentioned before, is uh, what we call Deep PCB. So that's basically so, uh, solving printed uh, circuit boards using uh, deep learning, specifically multi-agent reinforcement learning. So this is actually a very sort of difficult uh, problem. And what makes it so hard is that there's so many components and so many possible ways of connecting the wires. 
And what usually happens is you have a highly specialized team that spend ages, you know, putting together these uh, these circuit boards. And basically what we're trying to do is frame this as a multi-agent reinforcement learning problem and come up with a solution that's more efficient and, and also better. Okay, next slide. Perfect. And then one of our other long-term collaborations with, is with Deutsche Bahn. Um, so here, the key challenge that we're trying to solve is how to emission, uh, efficiently manage dense traffic on complex ra uh, railway networks. And this is also a really, really difficult problem because there's many, many trains and many uh, potential routes for those trains. So you really need to develop a solution that scales and trains break down and there's delays. So the solution also must be robust. And finally, the trains really have to be on time. And in a country like, a country like Germany, this is particularly important. Um, they are very different sort of weighting standards than we do. Um, so your solution really needs to be efficient. And basically how we've tried to tackle this problem is to also frame it as a multi-agent reinforcement learning problem, whereby each train represents an agent and the trains got to coordinate together to ensure that they arrive on time. Next slide. Perfect. And then, of course, uh, Marva, which I'm very, very proud of. The research team done a fantastic job here releasing this uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning framework. This is designed specifically to have uh, several, you know, very useful architectural and environment integrations. And the whole idea here is that you, it's been designed with research and production in mind. So one of the things that's really convenient is that it integrates, you know, more or less seamlessly with many popular research environments. So you can see a couple of examples in, in the bottom, such as the grid walker and flatland. Um, and we've already managed to get some, um, you know, state of the art performance on these environments. And was what what was quite cool is that you know, uh, releasing Marva actually made quite a quite a bit of a splash in the research community, which was very very cool, and uh, was recognised by some of the top researchers at uh, DeepMind, which you can see on on the right there. So, yeah, we're very very proud of this. Um, so next slide, I think that. Yeah, so that concludes my, my little introduction, which I hope you enjoyed and have a better idea of what Incidif is about. So yeah, Kalia, you can take it away. Very okay, cool. Um, can you go and hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Great. Um, uh, thanks, Tom. So before we dive into multi-agent reinforcement learning, I'm just going to discuss some of the RL basics just to make sure we're all on the same playing field. If you've watched, I guess, any sort of talk in RL, um, you can't have a talk in RL without having this. And this is essentially the agent environment loop. Um, you have an agent and you have an environment. An agent takes an action in the environment and then the environment returns some sort of reward and also returns an observation. Uh, this reward is scalar and this observation can be a partial view of the world or it can be a holistic full view of everything that's happening in the world. Um, but the purpose of this observation or the state is to just give the agent a representation of the environment at a particular time. The main thing that I would say distinguishes RL from other forms of learning is that RL is, is goal-directed learning from interaction. So it's about interacting with the environment through trial and error and receiving some sort of reward where the agent wants to learn what to do. So when we say what to do, um, it's a policy, but what a policy is actually doing is just mapping situations to actions um, as to maximize a reward. So again, just to make sure we're on the same playing field, just gonna speak about some of the elements of RL. Firstly, we have a policy. Um, a policy is just a mapping from states to actions. Uh, it's also perceived states, but we'll focus on just mapping states to actions. Um, a policy can be deterministic, where you, for a specific state, you get a specific action, or it can be stochastic, where you get a probability distribution over the actions, and then you need to do some sort of sampling to choose which action you want to take. Um, and this policy can be anything simple. It can be a simple function. It can be a lookup table. It can be a search process. Um, in deep RL, 
it's usually a neural network that's the policy but in other forms of rl a policy can be represented by any sort of function what we also have is reward and return um, as i mentioned earlier you can think of reward as just some scalar feedback that tells you how good is your current state this reward can be conditioned on the state and the action so if i'm in a specific state i take an action or the reward can be conditioned on the state, the action you take, and the future state that you end up in. But this reward, again, tells us how good the current state is, but it doesn't really tell us um, what we really want to know, which is the return. Um, the return tells us what's the expected cumulative reward over time. So the, as opposed to how good is my current state, um, what's the total cumulative reward I can expect over the lifetime um, from the state and following a specific trajectory. This return is also discounted. Um, the reason it's discounted, so there's some nice mathematical properties as to why it's discounted and it allows for convergence, but the, I guess informally, the important thing about this discount is that if you think about it, reward right now, is better than reward in the future. So you want to weight immediate rewards higher than rewards in the future. And we do this using this discount factor gamma over here. And this discount is between zero and one. So this is a policy which tells us how, I mean, sorry, this is the return, which is essentially what we're trying to optimize for in RL. Another important aspect of RL is value functions. Uh, if you think of a value informally, it just tells you what's good in the long run. Uh, you can have a value of a state, and you can also have a value of a state action pair. So the value of a state tells you how good is this current state. The value of a state action pair tells you how good is this state if I take this action. Um, and when I say how good, I simply mean the expected return. So we had the return over there. So when we say how good is a state or when we say how good is a state action pair, we're just referring to the expected return. Um, another thing that's important with these value functions is that they're conditioned on a policy. So it's conditioned on if you are taking a specific policy, how good is this current state? Because obviously, if you change the policy, then the value will change. So a small important thing to note is that value functions are conditioned on states. And there's two types of value functions. You get the state value function, which like I mentioned, just tells you how good a state is. And you get the Q value function, which tells you how good a state action pair is. Uh, and a critical part of RL is estimating these values. So across different RL algorithms, you, you don't always need a value function, but across, I would say, a lot of the modern RL algorithms, you need to estimate value. And so a big part of modern RL is dedicated to estimate how good certain state or state action pairs are. Okay, and then we have an MDP, which is just a mark of decision process. Um, it's a formal way to describe any sort of sequential decision-making problem and an important thing to mark of decision processes is that you have the Markov property uh, that just tells you that transitions only depend on the most recent state and action and no prior history. So again, informally, the current state contains all the information that we need. Uh, the whole MDP consists of this tuple, which is your states. It's a finite set of states. You have your actions. You have the transition probability. So the transition probability just relates to the dynamics of a specific environment. It says if you, um, like what's the probability of S prime? So what's the probability of a future state given you take, um, um, sorry, given you're in a specific state and you take an action. So the transition probability refers to the dynamics of the environment. We have a reward function as I previously mentioned and we also have the discount factor, which we use. Another important element of RL is the trajectory tau. So what you can think of this is we have an agent and we have an MDP. Uh, we can think of a trajectory as 
the steps that the agent takes throughout its lifetime. And the trajectory is composed of the states and the actions and the rewards. Sometimes the rewards aren't included here, but it just tells us what trajectory or path the agent took um, throughout a specific environment. So yeah, I feel like those are maybe the critical, but high level components of RL that are important to understand before we get a bit deeper uh, into the multi-agent side. Just on the taxonomy of RL, there's various different methods in RL. Um, currently, we're only gonna focus on model three methods. Um, all the model-based methods the main difference between model free and model based is that in model based, um, you need to predict what the environment will do next. But currently, we're going to focus on model free. Um, and we can split those into three different types of algorithms. You have algorithms that are that require a value function, so they need to estimate value. You have algorithms that learn the policy directly. And then you have algorithms that you can say are in between the two. So just to be a concrete here, um, we can split these algorithms, like I mentioned, into value-based methods, policy-based methods, and actor-critic methods. And here, um, the first row separates, or the first row indicates what these methods learn. So if it's a value-based algorithm, we're learning this Q-value function. If it's a policy-based algorithm, then we're learning the policy directly. Um, which is this pi over here. If it's an actor critic method, um, we learn a policy and the critic learns a value function. Um, I'm not really going to go too deep into that, but essentially the critic's value function is used to evaluate the actor's value function. So I would say these are the three main different kinds of RL algorithms. And outside of the learning, we also see how the, um, decisions are made. So how actions are taken in these different kinds of algorithms. In value-based algorithms, you simply take the argmax, not all the time, which I'll briefly speak about, but you just take the best action, whereas in policy-based and usually actor-critic-based methods, you sample from this policy distribution. An important thing to note is that in these value-based methods, you are learning a value function and then taking the action um, as the argmax. So it's off policy, the learning and the acting is different, is separated, where in policy-based methods, you are learning the policy directly and you're sampling actions from the policy. And it sounds like a very like small difference, but it's quite critical in RL. And this leads to various trade-offs. Um, usually you have policy-based methods that are more stable because you optimize the policy directly. Um, but then you have these value-based methods that um, are, are less stable than policy-based methods, but are more sample efficient. Um, so yeah, there's trade-offs between these separate algorithms. There's also trade-offs in terms of um, certain methods handle discrete actions better, while certain methods handle continuous actions better. And I guess with Actor Critic, they're trying to take the best of both worlds. So I'm also just going to briefly discuss DQN. The, the reason is that um, or one of the multi-agent reinforcement learning algorithms that I'm going to discuss a bit later is going to be based on DQN. Um, and also DQN was a really big breakthrough in reinforcement learning. It was the first RL algorithm to actually show that you could learn from raw pixels in a variety of environments. Um, and again, DQN is value-based, so over there. So what we're trying to learn is we're trying to learn this Q value function. This Q value function tells you um, if I'm in a specific state and I take a specific action, um, what's my expected return? So if you look at the diagram over here, we have states that go into a neural network, um, and then this neural network outputs these key values for state action pairs. And in DQN, um, I'm just also going to briefly discuss how DQNs do learning, and again, this will relate to something a bit in the future. So that's the main reason I'm mentioning it. But um, the way DQNs learn is that um, you have this predicted Q values. So over here in red, you can see these predicted Q values. Um, 
this is the Q value that's predicted for my current state and action. And that's what you get from the output of the network. And then what you do is you take the target. So the target is essentially this. So you do two passes through the network, the predicted, you pass the current state and, the, and then you take the action. Um, and in the target, you pass the future state. So um, you say, okay, if I had to just give a concrete example, in the predicted, let's say I'm going to take the first, um, let's say it's the first action, and then you take the first action, you receive a reward, and then you see what's the Q value of S prime according to if you took that first action. So there's this, um, how do I describe it? There's this sort of interplay between what your Q network predicts and what the target is, which depends on your future state. So you actually do two passes of this network and that's important, which I'll mention a bit later, why? And then the second part that's important is that in DQNs, when you're acting, um, let's see if I can go back. I mentioned that in value-based methods, you usually take the argmax. In DQN, it's a little bit different um, and not just DQN, but in methods that do epsilon greedy, you don't always take the argmax, um, you have this, uh, you have this epsilon, and based on this epsilon, you decide, am I going to take um, the best action or am I going to take a random action? And the main reason why we do this is because we want to explore the environment and we want to sort of have an interplay between exploration. Um, yeah, we want to have an interplay between exploration and exploitation. So the main reason why... DQN was such a breakthrough was it solved two fundamental problems in deep Q learning algorithms. The first one is that if we train our, if we train neural networks as value functions, um, neural networks struggle with data that's non-IID. So let's say I'm an agent, I take an action, and then you pass the sequential state action pair to your neural network and it eventually learns, but this sequence is correlated because it, it happens in turn and neural networks struggle with that. So to handle that um, in the DPN paper, they introduced or they used experience replay. Experience replay is just where you store, um, you store, how do I describe it? You store transitions in a replay buffer and then you sample these transitions either randomly or according to a priority, but this breaks the IID or th this brings it back to the IID setting because you're no longer getting the data sequentially. A second point um, that I think led to their success was they helped solve a really big instability problem in Q-learning where they froze this target network. So over here, um, if you can, there's two networks. Well, okay, it depends if you're doing double DQN, but let's say it's a single DQN network, um, a single Q-value network. We have the predicted and we have the target. Um, what they did to ensure stability is that they said, I'm going to freeze the weights of the target network. So they would freeze this target network for a certain amount of steps, let's say um, 100 or 1,000 steps. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to help handle the instability of the varying Q values that happens if you don't freeze this target Q network. So these, I would say, are two fundamental parts of most um, modern day deep RL algorithms. You will see most use an experience replay. And if you are calculating a value function, you would freeze the target Q network. And another paradigm in RL is that things have moved from I guess, single process RL to distributed RL. And what this means in distributed RL is that we split the acting and the learning. So you can think of the acting as just the agent executing a policy and the learning is actually learning the weights of a neural network. So these weights can be for a value function or it can be for the policy directly, but for distributed RL, we've seen the split where the acting and the learning part have been split into different processes. 
And that, I would say, is probably all you need as an overview into reinforcement learning. Uh, so now I'm going to discuss multi-agent reinforcement learning. But before that, I'm just going to quickly share the link for the notebooks just to make sure that everyone um, just to make sure that everyone can run the first cell in the notebook. Just give me one second. The installation part takes some time. Okay. So I'm just going to post it in the comments. Hopefully it is open. I wanted to have it on a GitHub repo, but <laughs> uh, it didn't really work out right now. Okay, so if you guys could go onto that um, Colab instance, I'm sure you can log in. And if you can run the installation cell. So that installation cell will install StarCraft um, and do various other things that we will need. Um, it does take some time. So that's why I'm um, urging everyone to do that now. So give me a second. Okay. So now I'm going to continue my talk, but but just a reminder, everyone, um, please go into that link, um, open Colab, and run that step one, which is installation cell, which installs StarCraft. Okay, now let me. Cool. Um, and I think I'll take um, questions at the end. So if you have questions, please do ask them, and I'll answer all the questions at the end. So. Now that we've had like a brief recap of RL, the next part is multi-agent RL. And it kind of leaves us with the important question, like why multi-agent RL? And I think one of the driving principles for this is that multi-agent problems are everywhere. So whether we think about things like train management or even a smart grid where you have to manage electricity usage of a lot of different um, industries, or if you think about traffic on a day-to-day, -day, or if you have one of these Roombas or home cleaning robots, essentially multi-agent problems are everywhere. Um, it's just currently a lot of the time they model the single agent problems. So we had that MDP previously where we had a single agent which took an action and then received a reward um, and received an observation from the environment. So the multi-agent setting isn't that different. Um, it's just now, as opposed to a single agent, you have multiple agents, and these multiple agents take actions, and these agents receive an observation, and they receive a reward. So quite similar to the setting, except instead of one agent, you have multiple agents. And there's a lot of different um, considerations when doing multi-agent reinforcement learning which actually affects whether these rewards are shared, whether these observations are shared, which I'll briefly discuss. The first thing is the reward. So if you have multiple agents, um, the setting depends on the type of reward. So if you have a cooperative setting, you'd have a shared team reward. So if your agents are working together to do some sort of task, you'd have a cooperative reward. Um, if you are doing a competitive setting, if your agents are actually competing against each other, then you have um, individual adversarial rewards where your reward, um, like you getting a high reward, uh, depends on other agents getting a low reward. So you have these individual adversarial rewards, um, and then you get mixed where it's like a combination of those rewards. So the setting depends on what sort of reward you can expect. Um, another thing that's important in multi-agent reinforcement learning is you need to think about partial or fully observable environments. So if we go back here, so here, can each of our agents see the whole environment um, or can they just see a partial view of the environment? And that makes a lot of differences to what sort of algorithms and how you represent um, the multi-agent systems. So do these agents have a partial view or a full view of the environment? The next thing is to think to think about is 
um, are the policies or value functions that you're learning, are they centralized or decentralized? So um, when we say that, we mean um, on the centralized side, are we learning, um, do we have some like puppeteer that learns actions for every agent, taking in the state for every agent? So is there one sort of single agent controller that controls all the agents and that takes in all the state and makes in all the action decisions for all the agents? Or are we decentralized, which means that um, does each agent um, learn its own policy and control its own actions throughout the environment? And this difference between centralized or decentralized, it becomes very important in multi-agent reinforcement learning. And then finally, another thing that's important is the training. Um, are we going to train these agents in a centralized manner or are we going to train them in a decentralized manner? So what this means is, if we train it centralized, we take all the agents together, we train all their policy networks or value networks together, um, and then, so that's centralized training, if you can actually train um, all the networks together, or do we train them in a decentralized way where each agent's policy and value networks are trained individually? And that's also quite important in multi-agent RL. So if we had to be a little bit formal, um, the, I guess the future slides are gonna focus on the cooperative setting where we have all these agents who have a shared reward and wanna work together. Um, and that is not only, I would say, a common setting, but, but, but also a setting that I think makes sense. Um, if you, let's say, have multiple agents and you want to have them achieve a certain goal, um, this would usually be in a cooperative setting where they work together. So if we had to take that NDP that we previously had and convert it to multi-agent, um, it, we like it's not that different. Um, we, we just change our set of actions to this U, which is a joint action space. Um, and this U just indicates to us um, it just indicates the action of each agent. So we previously in the MDP, um, we had one, one action. Um, here, we'd have an action per agent because we are multi-agent. Um, and this is a joint action space, which is represented by you. And over here, I just give a quick example. So U1 would just be the action of agent one. Um, and then what would change is that our transitions and our reward functions are now conditioned on this joint action space, where previously they were just conditioned on single actions. Now they're conditioned on vectors of actions for each of the agents. And you'd have this I that's just a finite set of agents. Um, and so it seems very similar to our previous MDP. And it's equivalent, actually, to an MDP with a factored or high dimensional action space. So what I mean by that is um, if this was single agent um, and we had an action space that was represented as a vector of, let's say, three numbers, um, this would be equivalent because there's nothing fundamentally multi-agent about this. If we have an action space that maybe has is, is made up of four variables, then everything else is conditioned on that. Um, it's still quite similar to, I would say, a single agent MDP um, with a high dimensional action space. And, and that's, I guess, the main reason why a lot of people move away from this setting and choose this DEC POMDP, um, which is a popular formulation of multi-agent reinforcement learning. The main differences with this is that, firstly, um, our, like, Firstly, our MDP is partially observable. So what this means is that the observations, every agent can't see everything. Um, the observation is conditioned on the state. Uh, I'll give an example of this in the next slide, but the observation is conditioned on the state and the index of the agent I. So we have, let's say, a whole map. Um, what you can see is dependent on which agent you are, and that is, um, I guess, what relates to the partial observability of the DEC POMDP. And an important thing with this is, and in general, partially observable environments, is that we need recurrence 
uh, because we need to remember past dates um, and have some, we need to remember past dates and have some sort of memory. So if you think about it, if you are in a map and you can only see, um, let's say, a grid block, as you move through that map, um, if you can't see what's in front of you or if you can't see what's behind you, you need some sort of memory to remember, okay, um, I previously walked in the specific region and when I was here last time, there was maybe a door or there was maybe an obstacle. So in partially observable environments, uh, it's quite important to have recurrence and memory so that you can remember when you can't see the full state of the whole environment. And with recurrence, uh, so yeah, the, the first part, partially observable, it's also decentralized. So what this decentralized means is that each agent learns their own policy that they can execute themselves. So this tower over here just refers to the trajectory of a specific agent as opposed to the trajectory of all the agents. Um, and then each agent learns a policy um, so this pi i just says it's my policy for a specific agent. Um, this ui is just the action for the agent, which is conditioned on the trajectory of the agent. So what decentralized means is the agent learns a policy based on its own action observation history. Um, and sometimes, it's not all the time, in DEC POMDPs, you actually take the whole trajectory as opposed to taking a single state. And what, what that means is you lose the Markov property and th there's some other considerations you have to make when you do that. But this is what, it's, it doesn't happen all the time, but what ends up happening is you condition on the agent's whole trajectory. So the next, I guess, question from that can be this decentralization. Um, why can like why do we do it why must the agent learn its own policy and i guess there's two sort of reasons the the first one you can say is um there's natural decentralization so if you think in the real world um, systems are sometimes naturally decentralized so if you have sensors or if you have individual robots or if you have individual cars um, the state the system is in is in like a naturally decentralized state and then the second type of decentralization is when you as the designer impose this decentralization. So you say, I'm gonna force my agents to have a partial view of the globe, uh, of the global state, and I'm gonna force them to learn their own actions because I want them to act individually, um, as opposed to having that, um, as opposed to having them um, work decentralized and act decentralized. So if we had to give an example in StarCraft, um, just about, I guess, the partial observability and the decentralization, on the left-hand side, you have the global state. You have the whole map, everything that's happening. And then on the right-hand side, you have the observation. So each agent can only see within a certain radius, and each agent acts individually. Um, it executes its own policy um, over time, as opposed to learning this global policy or global value function. And now if we think about how do we train these multi-agent reinforcement learning systems? So the I'll discuss a few paradigms, but the popular paradigm is centralized training and decentralized execution. But let's just go and explain the other paradigm, which is decentralized training and execution. So if we look at this diagram, Imagine we have three separate agents. Uh, each agent learns um, its own theta, so it learns its own weights, and these weights can be used for a policy or a value function. So here, each agent, um, the training happens decentralized, so we, we don't train all the agents together, and the execution is decentralized because these agents learn their own policies and they learn their own value functions. But the problem with this is, is that um, I guess this leads to some of the fundamental problems in multi-agent reinforcement learning where this leads to non-stationarity. So as an agent is acting and learning an environment, other agents are also acting and learning an environment. So independent learning makes it quite difficult 
for the agent to handle the environment because you're not the only one learning, the other agents are learning. So independent um, methods uh, where you either learn uh, independent like queue learning or independent actor critic is quite difficult because of this non-stationarity um, because basically all the agents are learning. So it's hard to learn while other people are also learning in the environment. The second point, it's hard to coordinate because if you want to coordinate, you need to be able to predict what other agents are doing. And this is very difficult in the decentralized setting. So if, if, if each agent learns individually and executes individually, it's hard to know what other agents are thinking. And this leads to, I would say, the most popular setting in multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, you could say it's almost like the default setting, which is centralized training and decentralized execution. So what this means is that each agent, um, is that, sorry, is that we train all the agents together. So we have centralized training. Um, and when we do centralized training, it gives us options to do a, a lot of interesting things. Uh, the first one is that, so over here in this diagram, each agent is learning its own weights for its policy. But what we can do is we can condition the value function on observations of all the agents. So because we're learning together, we can learn almost like a global value function across all the agents. And this, I, this global value function helps the other agents figure out and handle these problems with this decentralized training. So if you have um, a global value function across all the agents, you can handle things like non-stationarity. You can also better coordinate uh, your movement through the environment. Another thing you can do with centralized training is if we're training all our agents together, you can actually even use the same policy network. So um, if you use parameter sharing, all the policy networks can be the same. And this is actually quite common in RL where you sh share the same policy network. Um, and again, this might sound very not multi-agent. Um, it sounds like, are we really like if, Every agent has the same policy, isn't that cheating? Um, and I guess you could argue for either side, but the important thing is that even though each agent learns its own policy, this policy is conditioned on its own trajectory. So it's conditioned on its own state and actions. So if we go up here, if we go back here, over here, the policy is decentralized because um, the it's conditioned on the trajectory of the individual agent and so once we've completed the training, each agent, um, so once we've completed the training, we've done this training, because remember we split training and execution, um, we can throw away this value function and each agent can just act independently in the environment. Each agent can, um, because the policies are decentralized, each agent can just act and behave in the environment independently um, once we've completed the training process. So this is, I would say the main, benefit of centralized training. Um, you can train, you can use parameter sharing, and you can also learn uh, like a joint value function across all the agents. But again, there's certain problems with these because learning a value function over complex action space over all the agents is quite difficult and quite tricky. So what sometimes they end up doing is they factor these value functions. So as opposed to learning a value function across all the agents, maybe I'm gonna learn a value function grouping certain agents together, or maybe I'm going to do some sort of mixing. Um, and that's given rise to papers like VDN, QMix, et cetera. But we'll speak a bit about that in the notebook. If like, I guess we had, if I had to give a high level overview of single agent RL versus multi-agent RL, in single agent, you have full observability. You can see everything that's happening in the environment. Um, but the cons is that it usually doesn't scale. In multi-agent reinforcement learning, it's quite scalable because of this centralized training, decentralized execution paradigm. Um, you can also decompose a problem. You can have each agent learn different things. Um, so it helps decompose problems into like smaller chunks. And the cons are that partial observability, it's hard to handle that sometimes, and non-stationarity. So yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, 
I would say that's a, like an overview of multi-agent RL. And just to make things concrete, I'm just going to do a quick toy example. Uh, let's say we have these three robots who want to clean a specific house. Um, state space, that's a state space, that's the action space. If we had to do the single agent way or the single agent approach, what we'd have to do is we'd have to have a vector of size nine for our state space and a vector of size nine for action space. So here our actions are go up, down, or turn around. Our state space can just be, I don't know, like three random pixels around you. So in the single agent way, this is how we'd be forced to model it because we want to have a puppeteer agent who takes a state of all agents and um, finds these policies or these actions um, for all of these agents. If we do this the multi-agent way, uh, this moved a bit. If we do this the multi-agent way with centralized training and decentralized execution, and we do things like parameter sharing, and we have the centralized training, we can actually learn um, a much more scalable representation. And this representation stays the same. So if we, for example, say, I have a thousand agents or I have a hundred thousand agents, we're still learning in this smaller state and action space. And you, you can think about actually trying to learn a value function um, in the multi-agent setting, your state and action space doesn't grow exponentially as you have more agents. Where in the single agent setting, as you have more agents, it grows exponentially. So uh, a real important reason um, why multi-agent reinforcement learning is becoming popular and I think will become popular is simply the scalability. And there's a lot of other aspects in multi-agent reinforcement learning. There's learning emergent behaviors. There's um, learning to communicate, which is actually really interesting where um, you have communication channels between the agents and you these communication channels are differentiable. So you can learn to communicate between agents. You can also learn cooperation in um, cooperative settings. How What's the most effective way to cooperate with each other? And you can also have agents modeling other agents um, like trying to think of what's the motives behind other agents taking certain actions. So there's a lot of different aspects into multi-agent reinforcement learning, and it is growing into, I'd say, a very popular field. And that leads to, I guess, the last part of my presentation, um, which leads to MAVA, which is a research framework for distributed multi-agent reinforcement learning. So we built MAVA specifically for reinforcement learning um, so that we could handle um, these sort of environments um, and we could scale multi-agent reinforcement learning. So, so before this, um, I don't think there were that many RL or there, were, there weren't that many multi-agent reinforcement learning libraries and it was very difficult to get high quality implementations of these different algorithms in a way that's very scalable. So the MAVA design in a nutshell is, as you'd see in this diagram, we have these executors so, so what's an executor is um, you can just think of it as groups of actors. So let's say I have three actors and executor is just groups of actors that um, execute policies in a specific environment. So previously we had, uh, it's going a bit far back. We had actors with a single actor which takes an action and you had a learner. In Mava, we have the concept of executors which are multiple actors um, we also have trainers, which are multiple learners, because um, each, uh, well, depending on your implementation, you can have multiple um, learners or multiple trainers, which can be distributed across processes and GPUs. And then we have our data set, which is where we store experience, um, and that relates to experience replay, which I mentioned with DQN. So what I think we have a little visual to show. Okay, I'll show the visual. I think there's a video. Uh, can you guys see the video? Okay, let me try play it and then I'll check. Let me check the. So we have this concept of these executors. Um, they take actions in the environment. They generate experience. This experience is stored in the data set. And then 
what happens is the trainer takes this experience, learns new policies, and then sends the updated policies to the executors. So it's a split between um, execution, which is acting, the data set, which is um, essentially storing experience and the learning part. Okay, that's mother in a nutshell. And yeah, just the main aspects of what MAVA brings to the table. Um, it's designed to be flexible for research and production. It integrates with a lot of popular RL frameworks such as Acme, Reverb, Launchpad. Um, it's open source, so you guys can see the links. Um, it's actively developed. Um, we have a team of maintainers. Um, we also have like constant upgrades that are coming in, so that's a benefit. And it's also built with scaling in mind for real-world applications and for multi-agent real-world applications, which we think is going to be um, a big part of, I guess, the future of reinforcement learning. We've also achieved like state-of-the-art on certain environments. These, this is multi-walker. The goal is to just get these three agents to um, cooperatively move this poll together and we achieve state-of-the-art in this specific environment. Okay, uh, yeah, sources, questions. Now it's time for questions before we get to playing some StarCraft. Uh, so we have two questions. I'm going to sure. um, try to see if we can get um, in there on screen. Um, otherwise, perhaps you, in the meantime, you can answer Martha's question, which is the first one. Okay, there's a coordination problem for DC. Data fusion techniques to solve that problem. Decentralized training and execution. Um, data fusion techniques. I'm not really um, aware of data fusion techniques. Uh, Marta, can you just elaborate when you say data fusion techniques? Okay, uh, data fusion techniques there. I'm not 100% sure what Malta means by data fusion. Um, well, if I had to just again, just discuss the decentralized training. Um, so Dries replied. Okay, so if I had to just discuss the decentralized training, if you're decentralized training, you can't um, use information to update either the policy or value functions of other agents because you're decentralized. So um, like Dries's comment, um, when you say data fusion, combining data sets from different agents. Um, yeah, so I, I think I'd like just to answer that question, I'll maybe just wait to a clarification on data fusion, but important thing with oh, oh, sorry, and Martha's just added um, that she just means to uh, ways to combine data ways to combine data. Okay. Um, again, in decentralized training, um, you can't really combine data in the training side because it's decentralized. Um, so I'm not really sure in decentralized. So if you do decentralized training and decentralized execution um, without any sort of communication between the agents is no real way to combine data. So is it possible for data fusion to solve the problem? I don't think so. Um, if you want to get decentralized training and execution working, I think it, <laughs> it's a hard problem, but you would need to model other agents and you need to model what are the intentions of other agents. And I think that is very difficult. And that's why the community sort of used this centralized training, decentralized execution as a paradigm that works pretty well um, across most of the problems. Um, another example, if you have like robots in a factory, maybe in the evenings, the robots can update their policy networks or their value networks. And then during the day when the robots are actually executing, they execute independently. So it seems that the centralized training, decentralized execution is like a good framework um, to handle multi-agent reinforcement learning and a framework that's actually possible to make progress I think that's that question. 
Should I answer the second question? Should I? Yeah, I think let's go for it. So that'll be your mayor's question. I'll read it out. Uh, do you think evolutionary algorithms can somewhat increase the exploration ability of the single multi-agent system? Hmm, let me think about that. Increase the exploration ability. Um, it's a hard question. I'm not sure. So I guess if you're doing evolutionary algorithms, you're not doing RL. Uh, Siobhan, I think there's a bit of playback on your side. Oh, that's my bad. I'm sorry. I'll meet now. No worries. <laughs> Just weird hearing yourself. Um, do you think evolution can increase the exploration ability of single agent, multi-agent systems? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I think like evolutionary algorithms and like things like genetic algorithms are very like different in like when compared to RL, because RL you have a goal and you have this concept of interacting where in evolutionary algorithms, you have like a fitness function and you have these like um, mutations and these combinations of chromosomes. So do I think evolutionary algorithms can increase their exploration ability? I'm not sure how they would um, because like usually in RL, um, let's say in DQN, you model exploration and exploitation by using, um, by using this epsilon. And I guess you could maybe try and use evolutionary algorithms to learn this epsilon. Um, but yeah, I'm not 100% sure um, how evolutionary algorithms can be used to increase the exploration of single or multi-agent systems. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I think Tris covered the, the other questions. So um, I think we can carry on with uh, the next part of your, your presentation. Okay, cool, great. Now, <laughs> demos are hard, so let's see. Um, just firstly, was everyone able to access the link on Colab? Um, uh, not sure. Okay, then, then I, I think I'll just continue with the presentation. Let's connect. Just need to unshare my screen quick. Okay, cool. So yeah, the next part is playing StarCraft, um, saving the world of multi-agent reinforcement learning. So what we're gonna do in this is just go through the notebook and train some agents to play StarCraft. So the first thing is if you ran this installation, um, what you should have is you should have this third party folder um, and you should have StarCraft over there. Um, and that essentially, what this does is it installs the StarCraft game um, and handles a lot of the, I guess, background things that you need to be able to train agents in StarCraft. So my side, I ran it. So we have this folder, I'm just gonna import some modules. And now I'm gonna briefly discuss um, the StarCraft multi-agent challenge or the StarCraft multi-agent environment. So basically, let's run this song. It's an environment for multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, and yeah, I think I'll just play this video to, to just show the different settings, but what the StarCraft multi-agent challenge is or environment, it's just a baseline for multi-agent reinforcement learning. Um, and it's a way to evaluate how well your agents learn. And they make a lot of assumptions that I mentioned in the slide. So um, the agents are partially observable um, these agents act independently. So I'm just gonna quickly play this video so you can see um, what th the different scenarios. So they've developed these scenarios to test the agents in different environments. So this is uh, 3M, which is a map we're gonna play today, um, but they've tested various different scenarios and the maps for these different scenarios are different. So if I go to, let's say a harder map, um, you have like lava and you have other environmental factors that make it quite difficult for your agents to actually learn. Um, the cool thing about this is if you are on Windows and Mac, you can actually see the replays and see um, what your agents look like in the game. Unfortunately, because we are on um, like a Linux based operating system on Colab, we can't see um, the gameplay videos, but we can see um, 
we can see these animations that showed what happened in the gameplay. Um, yeah, so like I said, it's a popular environment for cooperative multi-agent reinforcement learning systems. It provides partial observability, challenging dynamics. It also provides a high dimensional observation space, which is quite important. If we had to think about just, you know, observations, actions, and rewards, um, again, partially observable, so you have a certain radius that your agent can see. Um, and this observation, you receive information about your allied and enemy units. So in StarCraft, you, it's, it, I guess the main focus is cooperation. So you need to cooperate with your units. So you have your allied units and you need to defeat your enemies. Uh, in your observation space, you see information about both your allied units and your enemy units. Uh, this is information. You see like the distance, how far away they are, what's their health, their shield. Um, you can also see the last action for your allied units. So what actions did your allies take? Um, and then on the action side, your agents can move around. They can attack the enemy. They can heal um, if you have this type of units. Uh, let me get out of that. Uh, they can also heal. Um, so these are the actions that the agents can take. Um, the action space is of dimension nine. Um, so there's nine different things you can do, and the one action is just a no operation, so do nothing. And then the, the reward is based on um, hit point damage that you get. So how much damage do, do you inflict um, to your opponents and how much damage do they inflict onto you? Uh, if you're following along in the notebook, you can see the calculation. Uh, let's see. Okay. You can see the calculation over there if you click through. Uh, the first thing in SMAX is you need to select the map. So if you click on this link, you'll see the various different maps that they have. And you can actually do that. So as opposed to 3M, which we're going to do three Marines for three Marines, which you can see over here, you can select um, like much more complicated maps um, when you come back to play around with this notebook. But currently, we're going to do 3M. OK. Um, and then we're going to train a VDN system. Um, again, I didn't really explain VDN, but VDN is based on DQN um, with some small subtleties. The main difference is that in VDN, um, it decomposes the team value function into an agent-wise value function. So as opposed to the whole team, as opposed to you having a value function across all your agents, um, you have each agent having their own value function. Um, and the, the main reason why that's useful is if you want to do uh, decentralized um, execution, it's quite valuable for you to have your own value function and not have like a shared team value function. And another important assumption with VDN is that um, if you additively combine every agent's value function, it's equivalent to this global value function. If you want more information on that, please have a look at the paper. Uh, but we're going to try and train a VDN system to play StarCraft. Um, we're just handling some of the logging code. Uh, we're also using the default network. So in Mava, um, you can use your custom queue network or policy network or value um, estimation networks that you want to use. But in this example, we're going to use the default one um, we're going to create our VDN system. So if you click through here, you can see all the different variables. Um, I'm not really going to talk through a lot of the variables, but this is just how you create a specific system in Mava. And then this is, you'd run this if you have things already running, um, which we don't. And then this is how you actually launch your Mava system. It's currently distributed, and we're saying only put the training part on the GPUs. So let's run that. Hopefully, Colab does not kick us out. <laughs> when I played around with this before, Colab kicked me out um, for, I don't know, high usage or something. So what currently happens is now we have different processes. So the main thing with Mava is that it's distributed. So we have different processes that handle replay memory, um, counter just counts different variables. We have a coordinator. Um, we have the trainer, executor, evaluator. So we have the different parts of Mava running in their own process. 
So what we can do is we can see the outputs. So currently each thing is logging to a specific location. Um, the evaluator is the process that tells us how good our um, training is currently going. So let's try and see some of the logs. We can see, okay, we've connected to StarCraft. So this is just some of the StarCraft logs. Um, after a while, you can see this actually training and you can see things like the re return or reward. You can see what actions different agents have taken. Um, usually outside of Colab, you'd see this on your terminal, just showing you all the outputs, but now we're logging it to specific files. Uh, we can also see our stored data. So we can see we have checkpoints. So with Nova, um, we log um, all our model checkpoints, so it's easy to restore. Uh, we also have recordings, which is just recordings of gameplay um, at a specific interval. And then we also have our TensorBoard logs, which are just logs of the agent's performance. And what we're going to try and do now is just see if we can see how our currently training agents are doing. Um, but before that, I'm going to quickly, uh, yeah, I'm, not, I'm sharing just a window. But if you click on this specific run, uh, if you click on this run, what it will do is it'll take you to um, a TensorBoard dev instance online, and it will show you some of the results that I got this morning when I ran this VDN system. And then um, here you can just see the different metrics, which I'll show you over here. But uh, if you don't want to wait for the whole system to train over time, you can just click on this link um, and then just view some of the results. So yes, we have our agent. It is doing things. Um, just on the, I guess, important things that we log currently, you can have a look at the actions. So this tells you for each agent, we have three Marines. What actions are they taking? Um, it just tells you specifically what action the different agents are taking. But in StarCraft, the real um, variables that we care about is the battles. So we have um, three battle-related um, parameters. We have the battles drawn. So how many of our battles have our agents drawn? Um, like when you draw is just when you ran out of time, um, you didn't win or your opponents didn't win. Um, battle games is how many games you played. And then battles won is how many um, battles has your agent won. Um, I'm surprised our agents have won some battles. <laughs> it usually takes a bit longer than that on Colab, but um, it means that our agents have learned some sort of behavior that allows them to defeat the opponent's agents. You can also see things like return. So if you want to see what's the average return, mean return, you can see the return. Um, the returns going up, which means that our agents are learning something. Uh, if you get a return of 20, it means that your agents have <laughs> learned very well and that um, in this specific 3M map, they're essentially beating the agents all the time. Um, but a return of five for, I don't know, like two minutes is really good. Um, and then we can see this win rate is the main thing that's reported in this paper is that just tells you what percentage of the matches are our agents winning. Currently, we're winning 25% of the games, which is really good. Um, so it means that our agents quickly have managed to learn how to defeat their opponents. Um, we also log various other things related to like performance and time. Um, currently, we're looking at the evaluator logs, but we have logs for all the other processes, but I'm not going to take you through that, but it shows that our agents are actually learning something in Colab, which is good because um, your yeah, demos usually don't go too well. Um, and now another thing is we can view our agents recording so we can see um, what our agents are doing. So I'm just going to show some examples of what poorly ag agents, what poorly trained agents end up doing is they end up doing basically just running away. So this is from a previous run. These agents just run away and they hide in the corners. Um, and because it's partially observable, the other agents really can't see them that well. Um, so this is when the agent hasn't really been trained that well. But then if you train your agents and they've learned some sort of behavior, you can see the emergence of certain things. 
Um, things to look out for is things like focus fire. So focus fire is just when all your agents focus their fire on a specific um, specific enemy um, because that's an efficient way to kill the enemies as opposed to everyone sort of shooting randomly. Um, you can also, in some of the other maps, you learn formations based on the armor. If you have stronger armor, maybe you should be in the front. Um, and then also you learn um, you learn tactics like making the enemy units chase you while you're running away. Um, there's a lot of in, like interesting um, tactics that emerge after a while. But if you see over here, the, this focus fire is just an example of the system that's learned focus fire. And what we can do is we can check if our agents have managed to learn anything. Okay, we still have to wait for the recording. The recordings. Um, yeah, I think it's still running. So we set an uh, interval for the recording. So they, okay, so the recordings happen every um, 50 episodes. So we haven't reached that specific um, interval yet. So what we can do is just comment that. Move that out. Let's see our win rate. Is that improving? Has it stabilized? Okay, it seems like our win rate is stabilizing. Uh, let's see if we have any recordings available. Okay, so we have one recording available so far. Um, and what we can do is we can see what our current agents are looking like. So we only have one recording. Usually, um, if you train for like a prolonged period, you'll have various recordings, and we can see um, how the behavior changed from early in training. So maybe in the beginning of training agents ran away and then after a while agents learned some sort of coordinated behavior but let's see what our agents learned um currently we only have one file so uh let's run our most recent agents okay so our agents okay so they've learned to move to a specific corner and essentially hide um, with one agent basically going out to try and shoot but the rest of the agents saying it's it's better for them to hide in the corner and wait for the episode to end than actually get negative return than being aggressive uh what we can do is we can see do we have any more recordings so far no we don't um i'll run this again a bit later just to see how um how the visualizations of some of our different agents are looking um, and then in terms of, I guess, what's next, this is the general workflow that you would use to train these agents. Um, and then we can look more at our evaluation metrics. So we can say, it's our win rate. Okay, our win rate has started to stabilize um, and is decreasing. So sometimes what happens because we have an exploration rate, um, we explore more in the beginning and then we stop exploring um, our systems aren't going to always be deterministic. Um, in this case, our, we're winning about 15% of our games, but um, we, like our win rate is decreasing, which happens over time. And that can be as a result of like hyperparameters. Maybe we're not using the correct optimizers or we're not using um, the correct settings for Epsilon. So I'm just going to quickly see if we have another recording. Okay, we don't. Um, I think it's still waiting for that. So I guess the next part that I'll show is that with Mava, it's quite easy to scale. So the only real thing you have to do to scale to get more um, parallel processes is you need to change this number of executors variable. Um, I think it is over here. So you can change this number of executors and what that'll do is It'll create parallel processes um, of execution, so of agents acting. And what these parallel processes will do is, if you have more executors, you have more information being added to your replay buffer. Um, and then that sometimes leads to faster training because you have more information in your replay buffer. I'm going to quickly stop this one and see if we can run a... Okay, so I'm going to stop the previous run. And then quickly change the run the login config. So this number of executors, we can actually go, I guess, all the way up until, I don't think we have a limit, but I don't want to kill Colab. 
So let's say three. Um, let's have three executors running in parallel. And let's see the outputs. So previously um, we had one executor process. Now we have three executor processes. Um, and these executor processes are running in parallel and they are adding information to our replay buffer. For our data sets, that's fine. We can try and see the painter board for this new scaling run. Okay, let's maybe give it a few seconds. Okay, let's just give that a few seconds. Actually. So the, the point with um, increasing the amount of executors is that if you can get more acting happening in your environment, the assumption is that hopefully it will lead to faster training and also, the sort of ease of increasing the number of executors is pretty useful um, without having to do any specific code changes on like the user side. Let's see if we have the right tensor board. Okay, I think it's still waiting. Let's just reload it. Well, we can see the RAMs going up. <laughs> so on collab side, it's definitely running. Let's view the output. So we can see that actions are being taken and different agents are doing different things. Okay, so we have our collab. Let's see if our win rate. So in this specific example, we've ran oh, for four seconds. So um, the win rate is still the same. Um, it hasn't really improved, but after you run this for a specific amount of time, um, what we hope to see is these agents train faster and converge faster um, than using a single executor. I'm going to just stop this run and then go on to like, what, what else can you do with these systems? What different hyperparameters can you try? So, so another thing you can try is maybe use larger Q networks. So again, um, the Q network tells you what's the expected return for state and action. Um, maybe if you increase the size, so we have the size variable, um, you'll have a larger network and maybe that will mean that your agents can learn faster. So you can also choose your own network and create and customize your own network. Um, but I'm not going to show that in this tutorial, but we have some examples on the other side. Um, so in this case, we're just going to increase our policy size. So previously we had, I think, a two layered network um, with a hidden size of 64 by 64. Now we have three layers um, that are quite big. And you can also do interesting like optimization tricks. Like let's try use learning rate decay. So here we're using learning rate decay um, and we are using SGD where previously we used RMS prop. So just trying different sort of optimization techniques to try and get this running uh, and to get this training a bit faster. Okay, so that's running. And again, we'll wait some time for this thing to, um, to get all the results and log to TensorBoard. Uh, while that is running, um, I think I will like be open to any questions um, and just in general, I'm pretty open to maybe trying different variations. Do people have maybe things they want to try for the Epsilon exploration or any other of these interesting variables on the VDN side? So let's see if there's questions. Cool, I think everyone is good. Uh, yeah, I don't think there's um, been any questions, but maybe we can wait a minute to see if anyone posts. Cool. Um, I do see that Dries answered a specific question. Uh, multiple computers at once across the network. That's a good question. Um, yeah, like Dries said, it is on the roadmap um, for us to train across multiple computers. 
now we're currently training across, um, like we're doing this in Colab, and we're training across different processes in Colab, um, but we haven't, um, we, it's on our to-do list, but we haven't added multi like node training across different uh, compute instances. Um, I think that's definitely on the to-do list. Let's see if our agents are learning okay. Okay, so in this case, they are learning. Okay, it's still about 50 seconds. So usually to train agents on um, this 3M map, I think with this configuration probably takes about half an hour. Um, so I think usually in the papers and stuff, it can take a few hours. So I, I think this is more of just up to people to play around with, maybe try different hyperparameters um, and try and see how fast they can get these agents to train. Um, like I said, a score of about five for the return. So a score about, of about five for the mean episode return is pretty good. Uh, we can see here we're getting um, a score close to that. Let me just make that full screen. So we're getting a score pretty close to that, which is around four and a half. And eventually what that usually leads to is currently we, we've drawn some battles. Um, we haven't won any, but after a while you end up winning a lot of the battles because you've learned um, this emergent behavior that I mentioned above. And yeah, so again, we have a lot of different examples on using different systems, using different environments, different architectures. Um, on our GitHub page. So please do um, have a look at the examples there. Currently, I think we just have to, I guess, wait to see if our agents are training. Okay, here we've started to win some, which is good. Um, so our agents are starting to win maps. Okay, so agents are starting to win. If we look at our win rate, it should be better than zero. Okay, so our win rate has moved to about 15%, um, which is good, which means we're winning about 20% of the battles that we currently have. Uh, what I can do is quickly see if we can visualize what those agents look like. So let's see if we have some new recordings. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so, so here we're starting to learn um, a lot more, I would say, coordinated behavior. Again, we're seeing even after what, like 51 episodes or evaluation episodes, um, the agents are learning to um, coordinate or they're learning to focus fire, so they're learning to shoot together and also uh, probably too early to say they're learning formations, but our agents are learning sort of emergent behavior. Uh, what we can quickly do is try and see, maybe let's be a bit more ambitious. So we can try maybe a harder map, which I don't think will get learning on Colab, um, but just to show what the harder map looks like. So let me stop some of the older runs. So Let's try to do 8M. So an 8M, it just means that we have eight Marines versus eight Marines. So as opposed to 3M, let's try 8M. I try a map and let's see if we can actually train a system to do, to learn any sort of behavior on 8M. Yeah, that's probably going to take a while to run, but um, we will make this notebook open source. So at any time you can try some of the harder maps. So there's certain maps of 27 units and where the kinds of units um, aren't homogenous. So currently 8M just means everyone's a Marine, but in some of these other maps, I can quickly play this, you'll see that there's different unit types and then with different unit types, there's different um, like problems in terms of coordination, 
um, because of the different state and action space. So I think let's see if our 8M has actually managed to train anything. It's unlikely because the, the 8M is really difficult, uh, especially if you're running it on Colab. Um, Okay, but I guess we'll have to wait on that side. Um, I think for now, I'll check questions, see any posts. Okay, I think that's it from my side. I'll just do a quick check to see if our 8M has maybe learned something. And then I'm open to questions or like any sort of discussions on multi-agent reinforcement learning. Okay, let's see if we can visualize our agents. Okay, let's see if we have a recording on this. Might still be the previous recording, so let's see. Okay, it's still the previous recording. So that means we haven't gotten any new recordings on 8M yet. But yeah, I'm not optimistic on us being able to learn that in CoLab in a short amount of time, but it's just basically eight times the amount of Marines. Um, yeah, but you, you can use any sort of map that's available on SMAC and just change the map parameter over here. Cool, I think that's all I wanted to show um, during this interactive session. Um, does anyone have any sort of questions on anything multi-agent related? Um, was everyone able to actually run the notebook or? Uh, the question, let me ask, are there many maps with base building elements and not just units? So um, in SMAC, uh, they do, I can't remember how they refer to it. Um, but it's only unit level management. Um, so they they don't do, I guess, macro management, like managing of resources and building. So in the SMAC environment for multi-agent, there is uh, no base building, it's just units. Um, there is, I guess, um, different environments that allow you to do like um, base building and other macro management things, but they aren't specifically multi-agent, so they won't enforce um, th they won't enforce independent RL agents and they also won't enforce um, partial observability. So uh, I think something similar to OpenAI Starcraft um, success where it's like a single large agent, um, like a master agent that decides what all the different agents do. So yeah, um, you can't do that using Smack. Um, but I think there is other single agent versions of StarCraft environments where you can do that. Um, I've just seen if um, Steve can come on screen. Um, sure. Otherwise, I'll sure. leave the question out. Ah, no, I will ask the question. Um, so uh, do all algorithms come with default networks and how were the default networks designed? Uh, yeah, so currently all the networks we've implemented, I mean, all the systems, so we've developed multiple algorithms, they all come with default networks. Um, those default networks were chosen, so um, using sort of best practices, which we saw. Um, so we tried a lot of different network architectures and we found certain architectures to work well with certain algorithms. Um, and also, um, so Mava was built using a lot of the sort of design ideas of ACME, which is DeepMind single agent framework. So um, a lot of the like policy networks or key value networks design is quite similar to ACME, um, but we've also sort of evaluated and tested that these policy or value networks work well and adapted them to multi-agent. So, um, yeah, experimentally, we've tested them and um, we did get some inspiration from ACME.
Fantastic. Um, I think oh, I think that is the end of our questions. So okay. yeah, I'm just gonna um, lead a round of applause. It's just me you can hear, but I'm sure everyone's clapping. Thank you um, very much for your time today and to the whole team. It was a, a lot of fun and yeah, super informative. Um, and it's all recorded, so you can always just refer back to the video if you need help. Thank you very much. Cool, great. Thanks, thanks for having me. I had a bit of load shedding before this, so oh. it was a bit of a rush um, to make it, but hopefully everything made sense and yeah, hopefully it is useful for everyone who watched. Yeah, I don't think we would have noticed. It was, yeah, very smooth. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm going to um, end the session there. Uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, send them on the Discord channel. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, thanks, everyone.